The Apollo moon landings ended in December 1972 with the conclusion of Apollo 17. And the 50 years since then, no humans, at least none that we know of, have been back there. Or, as some people would rather claim, it's been 50 years since NASA stopped faking the moon landings and no one's ever been there. And this 50-year gap is often used as an argument that the landings were faked, usually accompanied with a statement along the lines of how come they could get to the moon in the 1960s and yet we haven't been back since despite all the advancements in technology. Or why has no other country sent people there? Surely this is all proof that they couldn't have actually made it there in the first place. Except opting to send humans to the moon isn't just a question of can you make the equipment to get there, there's also the cost implications and what benefit will that bring as to whether it's justifiable or not. The analogy that I personally prefer using to highlight this situation is Concorde, which was one of only two commercial aircraft ever to enter service that was capable of flying faster than the speed of sound, the other one being the Soviet Tupolev Tu-144. Now, both of these were developed through the mid-1960s, both took their first flights at the end of the 60s, and both entered commercial service in the mid-1970s, so about the same time frame as Apollo. Now, the Tupolev only lasted about three years carrying public passengers before it was withdrawn in 1978 because it wasn't a particularly good aircraft. Concorde, on the other hand, had quite a long career before being retired in the early 2000s due to its very high running costs. So why has nobody made a new supersonic plane since, when it was possible in the 60s, despite all this newer technology? Why has no manufacturer produced a brand new supersonic passenger plane? Why hasn't one of the big airlines called up BAE and asked them to knock together another original Concorde, since, you know, they should still have the designs for it? Does it mean that Concorde was actually faked and never really achieved what was claimed? Of course not. It just boils down to affordability. Airlines don't want to hemorrhage money in supersonic planes when it's far more cost effective to use regular aircraft. And the same basic principles are in play when it comes to going to the moon. For example, while humans might have stopped going to the moon, there have continued to be probes, orbiters and rovers from many different nations still being sent there in the years since Apollo's ended. So they haven't lost the ability to navigate and reach the moon. Getting to the moon always follows the same basic principle. You get a craft into low Earth orbit, and then at the right time in your orbit, you perform an engine burn to increase your velocity, which in turn moves your orbital distance further away from the Earth, and eventually you have a velocity where your orbit will reach the moon's distance. And as long as you've timed this burn right, you'll reach that distance just as the moon comes by. Now, the velocity for any spacecraft to reach that particular distance is always around about the same, regardless of the spacecraft. The issue boils down to a matter of weight. The more weight that you're trying to get to the moon, then the more energy has to be inputted during that burn to get the spacecraft's velocity to that required figure. That requires more thrust and more fuel, which means that's more weight that you have to get into orbit around the Earth in the first place, meaning more thrust and fuel is required from the launch vehicle to get everything up to begin with. This then means a generally overall much larger rocket, more powerful engines and larger facilities to be able to handle everything, and it's going to be much more expensive. Getting humans to the moon also means that the spacecraft has to have space for them to live during the mission, as well as food and life support systems, all of which again increase the size and the weight that you need to get into orbit. Weight which you don't have to worry about with a rover going to the moon, because a rover is not going to complain if it's packed into a tiny box with no air supply. For example, at the same time that the Apollo missions were taking place, the Soviets were actually sending their unmanned lunar rovers to the moon to collect and return soil samples. Now, the Apollo Command Service Module and Lunar Modules, which were what went to the moon, had a total launch weight of 45,000 kilos, whilst the Soviet lunar probe's launch weight was only 5,800 kilos. That's almost eight times more weight for Apollo, so, obviously, it requires a significantly larger rocket to get humans to the moon. Humans' time on the surface is then also restricted because they can only carry limited oxygen supplies and they have to have rests, whilst a rover can work continuously, 
So a rover not only means a smaller and cheaper rocket, but is also arguably far more productive, and thus much more cost effective. It just doesn't have quite the same bragging rights to say you were the first to get a rover to the moon compared to getting humans there. And whilst Apollo achieved that accolade, it was not cheap to do. The entire Apollo project totaled the equivalent of over $250 billion in today's money. It cost them a billion dollars per mission, which managed to get, what, the sum total of two people onto the moon's surface for about 10 hours? Not particularly feasible long term. NASA had plans in place for humans to carry on to Mars by 1980 by creating a nuclear-powered S-4B stage for the Saturn V, and later even had plans for colonising the moon, proposals which would have required a lot of money to make happen. And at its peak in the mid-1960s, NASA was receiving almost 5% of the entire US budget just to try and get some people to the moon in the first place. Sums of money which were justified at the time by trying to beat the Soviets, but not a figure that was sustainable for any length of time, especially since public interest in the moon landings had all but disappeared by around Apollo 15. Probably would have been gone sooner had it not been for Apollo 13 going wrong. At that time in the early 70s, America was having big poverty problems, and the Vietnam War was taking place as well, so the public didn't really want all that money being spent on NASA, and let's face it, governments are going to allocate budgets based on what's likely to make them more popular with the public voters. Hence, by the early 70s, they'd pretty much forced NASA to scrap the Apollo program and cancel the last three proposed missions up to Apollo 20. After this, NASA's focus moved to low Earth orbit and the development of the space shuttle and the space station, which they were touting as being the beginning of making space affordable for the public by creating a cheaper, more reusable vehicle. A project which the government approved of, but more because the Department of Defense liked the idea of a heavy lift vehicle that could put large spy satellites into orbit. But this shift to the space shuttle and the idea of a more reusable spacecraft, unlike Apollo, meant that a lot of the Apollo hardware became obsolete, such as the colossal F1 engines which had powered the Saturn V off the launch pad, no longer required, so Rocketdyte stopped producing them. Even the launch facilities were changed. The launch pad 39B was completely redesigned to work with the shuttle rather than the Saturn V. So the problems of going back there now, well, the big one still remains money. NASA have been given the green light for going back to the moon, but their budget now is less than 1% of the US total, and that's with numerous other projects ongoing as well. So they don't have anywhere near the relative resources to throw at it that they had back in the 60s. So for the argument of why don't they just rebuild the Saturn V now and go back to the moon, firstly, the Saturn V was built in a time when everything was hand-designed and hand-built, and by numerous different companies. So it's not just a simple case of take the old designs and churn out the new parts and recreate an original Saturn V. There would need to be a lot of trial and error and reverse engineering to work out how the parts were actually made. It would be like calling up Ford and asking them to put together an original spec Model T. Plus, as mentioned, the old Saturn launch facilities were all changed to suit the shuttle, so they would need to be reverted back to be able to handle a Saturn V. And for all of that hassle, NASA would be left with what? A rocket that, again, could get two people to the surface of the moon for a few hours, which they've already managed to do. That's a lot of money to achieve pretty much nothing. And modifying a Saturn V to use modern tech wouldn't be particularly easy either, because once they start changing some of the parts, then they have to change a lot of other parts to be able to work with them, and it basically means a complete redesign in order to facilitate it all. It would be like trying to renovate a really old house. Sometimes it's just cheaper and easier to wipe the slate clean and start afresh, which is what they've done to an extent with the SLS, although that uses a lot of the shuttle parts and design concepts to reduce costs and to be able to work with the launch facilities without much change. Now, whilst I bring up the SLS, I should head off the next point that some people will undoubtedly bring up, which is NASA testing Orion in the Van Allen belts. The Van Allen radiation belts are often a point of contention with conspiracy theorists questioning how Apollo managed to fly through them. 
Well, the answer is Apollo took a route that went through the thinnest parts to minimize the exposure time, and the spacecraft had shielding, which reduced the overall exposure levels. Now, there is a video that often circulates around this point, which is one of NASA's staff talking about Orion's first test flight and them needing to send it through the Van Allen belts to verify that Orion could handle them. And people ask, why would NASA need to test this? Firstly, the video does state that they wanted to test the navigation systems. Radiation like this could harm the guidance systems, onboard computers, or other electronics on Orion. Naturally, we have to pass through this danger zone twice, once up, once back. Because modern computers are far more susceptible to radiation than the older, more mechanical systems used in Apollo. Secondly, the Apollo missions were in space for less than two weeks, whereas Artemis 3 is already being touted at being a month-long mission, with later missions probably even longer than that. And lastly, it's perfectly normal for any new vehicle to be tested at extremes before being pushed into service. Just because a car manufacturer's last car was deemed perfectly safe doesn't mean their next car isn't still going to be flung into a wall, just to be sure. As for other countries not sending humans to the moon, well, the Soviets, as we discussed earlier, were trying in the 60s. They had unmanned craft that were trying to lay the groundwork before the crewed missions would take place. They actually had their Zond program trying to get to the moon with the intention that they wanted to use that to get a crew to be able to orbit the moon. Except they kept having problems with the unmanned flight to the point that before they'd even managed to get a crewed flight going, NASA had not only beat them into getting into orbit around the moon, but beat them to landing on it as well. So the Soviets pretty much decided that there was no point continuing to spend huge amounts of money trying to solve all these problems with the Zond craft when they were only ever going to be second best. And other space agencies just don't have the resources that come close to the size of NASA. So again, it's hardly a priority for them to try and just be runner-up. Much like how there was big interest in the early 1900s for expeditions to try and make it to the South Pole. But once that goal was achieved, there was hardly any interest to send more expeditions. And as we covered earlier, it's far more cost-effective from a research perspective to send robotic equipment that can work non-stop for long periods of time and doesn't need anywhere near the scale of rocket in order to get there. That's obviously not to say there is no reason to send humans back to the moon, especially given the long-term prospects of creating settlements there and the ultimate goal of sending humans much further into space. It's just not as much of a priority trying to get humans to the moon now as it was back in the 60s, because now it's already been done. Anyway, that's going to conclude this particular video. As always, feel free to leave your thoughts in the comments down below. If you enjoyed the video and you haven't already done so, then please consider hitting the like and subscribe button. And if you'd like to help support the channel further, there is a link to my Patreon account as well. And hopefully, we'll see you in the next video.